Welcome to another law video and the two big bits of news are the arrival of the T8 and the changes to engineering. The T8 is available for early access purchase with Arx points while the Python Mark II which has spent the last three months only being available by spending Arx is now in the shipyards so if you want a Python Mark II you can just buy one now. Like the Python Mark II the T8 will be Arx only for three months and then you'll be able to get one for in-game credits from all good shipyards in November. If you've seen Burt or any of the big providers or streamers, you'll have seen a fair bit about the T8 already and the materials update. The requirement to unlock engineers has been reduced, including the Odyssey engineers. There's fewer engineering roles with consistent increases. More materials found in signal sources and more materials given as mission rewards. And even materials being given out for helping to clear invasions. As you can see here, I got 20 units each for two RAWs, two manufactured and two data materials for helping to clear Sukubago. And the removal of power regulators for upgrading suits. Those are just some of the features and it's clear that FDEV want everyone to get into the last bit of the war and into the upcoming power play update without feeling disadvantaged by having no engineering unlocked and the sheer time it takes to get what you need. This article has Aegis talking about the new rewards for fighting in the war and I'll link to the update notes below so you can read about every change this update brings. There is a downside which is that engineering has gone from being optional when it came in to indispensable now. But if we're honest that ship sailed long ago and the argument that you don't need to engineer anything or unlock anything doesn't really work anymore and hasn't for years. There are simply too many advantages to be had by engineering and unlocking modules, so the necessity of it has become a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy. Whatever your personal feelings about that, the aim is clearly to make engineering easier and less of a chore, especially for newer and experienced players, so that they can feel that they're participating on a level playing field and don't have to be a hardcore material grinder to get there. On to the T8 then, and this article has a brief discussion about the troubles Lacon had to make it which were to do with using the SCO drive and making it stable with the extra forces involved. They pulled in all of their engineering experience and they pushed the ship's frame to be the biggest that would still fit on a medium pad, which is a nice way to tie in this characteristic to a bit of story. It wasn't just about giving it more capacity than any other medium ship so far, and the extra capacity may have even been a happy side effect of having to increase the size of the chassis. It's always nice when you can turn an engineering logistics problem into a selling point. As with a Python Mark II, there are two versions of the T8. There's a basic one, and there's a one with better parts, a ship kit, and a livery. Last time I got the full Monty, so this time I'm going for the basic T8. I'm going to engineer it from scratch to see how much faster the changes to engineering make the process, and then I'm going to assess the new ship as a rescue ship. Let's take a look at this thing. I was going to say that it's not exactly built for aesthetics, but I suppose that depends on what you call aesthetics. This article has a spokesman from Lacon saying it's aesthetically charming, which is one way of putting it. If they didn't pay him a lot of money to say that, then I'll have a pint of whatever he's on. But it's very Lacon, isn't it? Especially the cockpit and the view. Even with those big arms, your visibility is still very good. But it's very functional looking and some people like that saying it reminds them of the more industrial looking ships in The Expanse and other sci-fi. It reminds me of the ships that you used to see on the cover of the old 70s paperback anthologies of science fiction short stories like it was built from Lego but in a good way. Engineering didn't take too long. I already had the data and manufactured materials from doing rescues to use directly or trade for what I needed and raw materials from my last trip to the crystal fields so I could just get on with engineering. It took just over an hour to fly around and fully engineer the power plant, the SCO frameshift drive, the thrusters, the life support, the power distributor and the sensors. The only thing I didn't do was the armour. The engineering roles are a straight number now so a grade 5 enhancement to any module is exactly 5 roles. The hard points don't really make this a combat ship, with them all being class 1 except for one which is class 2. That said, it could still pack a bit of firepower to protect itself while hauling or mining, enough to handle the odd NPC pirate anyway. 
An all-in-one mining ship is a solid role for the T-8 and Burr tried that in his video. He fitted it for all kinds of mining, laser, subsurface and core mining, all in one ship. He seemed to get on fine with the normal mining lasers, even though it meant using class 1 lasers. Alternatively, you could go and unlock the engineered class 1 mining lasers from the Minotaur Val and fit a few of those. It would be the ideal ship for them. He mentioned overcharging the power plant for mining and that's probably a good move. Or armoured if you can get away with it. Also in his loadout he used class 5 Kleptal limpets, but equally you could take a universal limpet controller in the class 7 slot. Having engineered mine for rescues, how does it compare to the best medium ship until now, the original Python? Has the most versatile medium ship in the game finally been superseded? We normally run shieldless unless we really need extra protection because the scythe doesn't use its lightning attack if you're shieldless or we turn the shield off when jumping out with passengers, leaving only the missiles and the hatch breakers to worry about as you get away and those are taken care of by the ECMs. Therefore, hull reinforcement packages are part of the build. The hull hardness and the characteristics of the ship itself also play a part in how fast they take damage. For example, if you put a whole reinforcement package in a Federal Assault ship, and it's very, very strong, but if you put one in a Ferdelance, it's weaker because the Ferdelance is a shield tank and the Federal Assault ship is a hull tank. So far, the T-8 appears to be a bit more of a hull tank than the Python and takes a little bit less damage over time using the same reinforcements. The thrusters, especially the lateral thrusters, are strong and the yaw is really good as well. So it's very fast to zero in on the pad and manoeuvre onto it for those manual landings. Heat management is excellent. Getting away or getting in fast to rescue is quick and efficient. And the agility in supercruise is more than acceptable as well. It's quite agile in supercruise. Compared to the Python, the range is a little better. The capacity is a bit bigger. The top speed is the same in rescue trim and so is the boost time. The operational range, that is how far it can go on a full tank, is a bit higher and in every way it's a little better all round than the original Python. When the Python Mark II was announced we all wondered if it would supersede the original because at the time we knew nothing about it but then when we found out it was going to be a combat ship that was clearly not the case and in fact it's more likely this ship that's going to be used instead of the original Python. Does it make the Python obsolete? No I don't think so. The original Python is still a great ship, and once you have one, and especially once you have one fully engineered, it's too useful to just get rid of, so I don't see any reason to start replacing all the Pythons you might have with T8s. But the T8 has got a lot going for it, and I will certainly be using it as a dedicated medium rescue ship instead of the Python from now on, and saving the Python for other stuff. Compared to the Python, the situation with the T8 is a bit like when I bought a camera a few years ago, which didn't appear to be much of an upgrade from the previous model, and most of the reviews said so as well. They said the small improvements weren't worth the upgrade if you had the previous model already, so it was only worth it if you were buying into that range for the first time. However, what they didn't take into account was firstly, a couple of new technologies that turned out to be game changers for how I was working, like the anti-flicker technology for artificial light to help get more consistent exposures, and secondly, because everything had had a small improvement to how it worked, focusing, handling, processing speed, when you added up all those incremental improvements, it was a big step forward in everything about the camera, from quality and ease of use to consistent shooting and ergonomics which put a lot less strain on the shoulders and hands for a nicer shooting experience and the reviews underestimated the importance of that when you're carrying it around and using it all day. The T8 is a bit like that camera for me. On the face of it, and if you only compared it feature for feature, it seems to be a series of small improvements everywhere and so you could think, oh that's no big deal, but it's got the game changing feature with the improved stability, heat management and fuel consumption of the SCO frameshift drive, just like the Python Mark II, and the small improvements to range, hull strength, speed, capacity and agility add up to a ship that feels like its own thing, as well as being a real step forward in functionality and usability. 
So far with both ships I think they've done an excellent job to give them their own unique flight models and characteristics. Other stuff happening at the moment? Well, Thor almost went down last week due to a new development which this article discusses. Spire sites are reactivating after being destroyed, and from what we can tell they're sacrificing five control systems to reactivate a spire. Of course from our point of view this makes it even easier to take down multiple systems by sabotaging the spires all over again, so what may be seen as a reinforcing of their core systems by the Thargoids actually opens them up to being taken down even faster. And so with that in mind, a brave attempt was made last week to try and get Thor down to just three systems for this week. It was a Herculean effort and it only just missed. Four systems remained at the end of last week, so this week, and because they're all previously populated and they've all been designated as counter-strikes, they've all got a port open and under attack, with no missions but providing basic services for people to park and fight which is usually a low conflict zone around the port. So although the target was only just missed, all four of the remaining systems should get cleared in short order, one's down already and in plenty of time to take Thor down for next Thargs Day. The Counter-Strike ports falling fast is being helped out by the handing in of pods from Thor to give them a head start. Last weekend Operation Thunderstruck and the Xeno Strike Force joined forces to collect thousands of pods from Thor and do some fighting there. The tactic of handing in the pods from Titans up until about Sunday evening and then after that holding on to any that you get and handing them in after the tick on Thursday works very well. Over the weekend it gives the anti-Xeno pilots an idea of what systems they can reasonably finish by Thursday without those pods being wasted on systems they won't get to do in time and then the ones handed in on Thursday give the freshly assigned counter-strike systems a head start. Stories and community goals are slowly creeping back as we get closer to the power play update, including this one, which would appear to be setting up a potential story with an assassination attempt on Emperor Orissa. What appeared to be a suicide squad attacked her ship and its escort and got blown away. Is this the start of another series of attacks against the Empire? Is it another inside job like the NMLA? the terrorist group invented by senators to undermine Orissa, or is it some outside force? And to what end? With this, and the attack on Achilles a few weeks ago, corporate wars, faction wars, and even superpower wars seem to be the way things are going with these initial shots fired, and which I assume are all going to dovetail into the power play update. It seems for the moment that Sirius are conceding the FSD business to Achilles, and they're more concerned at the moment with getting their hands on Utopia's knowledge by buying out and bribing the commune's suppliers to get some leverage on Utopia to give them their data. Utopia have already lost technology to others in the past and so they're naturally wary about what this push from Sirius to acquire their data stores is for. So they've responded with a two-handed community goal, one to bring data items and one to bring commodities which is a little bit different from the combat and trade combo that we get, bring us goods and protect those goods from piracy. It runs for the usual week, the cash isn't bad, and it will be interesting to see how a successful goal will affect the story. With more data points now at Jameson's crash site, you can fill up even faster than before on data materials, and that's only a few jumps away, so it's an easy one to contribute to. The last we heard from Utopia... They had some ideas about how Salvation might be able to upload his consciousness into Guardian technology. They invited Shojin A to talk to them about it, and she did. But she kept any details of their conversation to herself, and Aegis hasn't pressed her on it. Could this be the research that Sirius wants to get hold of? Having lost out in the frameshift drive business, are they now looking to get a monopoly on consciousness transfer? Not just making a copy of someone from their brainwaves and memories, as Utopia do now, but actual transfer with some new way of using Guardian energy. Who needs spaceships when you can send your mind anywhere at the speed of thought, as long as there's a compatible piece of technology to receive it at the other end? Shojine hasn't been around a lot. She returned from a chat with Utopia back in December, and the last thing we heard from her was this week, with the spy sites being reactivated, but that was only to say that the withdrawal from several unpopulated systems near the Spire was no coincidence, which 
doesn't tell us anything we couldn't have guessed, but good to have it confirmed by the in-game narrative that pulling out of unpopulated systems and not invading any new unpopulated systems is part of the restructuring of the Titans' defences to fit in with the war changes in the last few weeks. And that's fine by me. I think having a pop-up every now and again saying, I just had a vision and this is what we must do next, that would be pretty lame. You know, they did it once to work out that the abducted people were being taken to the Titans and stored there, and that was fine. But having a turn up as some kind of dungeon master giving us hints on what to do next would be a bit rubbish. We know we're being led by the story, but there are ways and ways, you know, and that would be a crude way. That said, if she does find out anything about Salvation, like if he's still alive somewhere, then obviously that's a question we'd all like answered. And that's about it for the moment. Thor will go down next week with no systems left, so find some time in between exploring the TA and all the material changes to get some Titan bombing in this week, and make your 2 million credits if you want the decal for when Thor goes down. Stay safe, and thanks for watching.